Hello, I'm Tom Hollingsworth and welcome to Networking Field Day. We are here in Palo Alto, California with our friends from Appstra. We are going to be listening in about their new product and solution. And we have around the table a group of Networking Field Day delegates. They represent the best and brightest podcasters, speakers, writers, and influencers in the community. They are going to be asking questions, making comments, and offering their opinions as part of an invited panel. If you would like to learn more about this event, including how to become one of these delegates or a presenter, please go to our website at techfieldday.com. You can also find more videos like this about a variety of technical subjects at our YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com slash techfieldday. Let's actually swap one of these switches um, for a completely different vendor using our tool. Okay. So, so as I said before, AOS builds the configuration based on all the parameters that you set for this network service. And we are going to go through that exact process in, the, in kind of the second part of our, our demonstration. But there's a whole build system for uh, this particular network service that we're going to go through in detail. But as a result of providing the parameters for this network service, what we build or fabricate for any given device, like say the spine, is the actual config. And in this case, this is a, a Dell. It's running Cumulus. And we fabricate uh, the Dell configuration or the Cumulus configuration as a series of files in this configuration that you would apply. And so you can see that these are all the interface commands that we would apply. And, um, and if I scroll down long enough, I'll hit the Quagga config. And this shows you all the Quagga config that we do. And this is essentially, we have these Jinja templates, if that's a familiar term for you that you, know, you can extend and play with. But these are what create these configs that we then manage and, and deploy onto the box. And this is very complicated stuff. And if, if, you've, never seen June, or, uh, if you've never seen Cumulus and Quagga, and you're like, well, how does that work in Quagga? You know, and you're learning Cumulus and Quagga for the first time, this is a great even learning tool, or vice versa. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially decommission Spine 1, and I'm going to replace it with a Cisco, because I have in my inventory, uh, you know, in this inventory, I have um, some devices. You can see I've got a Cisco uh, 93PQ. And uh, as part of our product, you know, when devices register with our product, uh, they're initially quarantined, but I'll show you that process. And then we gather uh, information about those devices. Uh, we call them facts. And these are information like the serial number and the hardware version and what version of operating system it's running on it. So these are all the pieces of information that let us know, is this device you know, relevant for our system? Does it match our system requirements? And we have a, a, a large uh, collection of all the hardware platforms that we support. So even in version 1, we have uh, 26 platforms that we support uh, over a combination of NXOS and Arista and Cumulus. And uh, in, in later versions, we're supporting uh, things Snap like, route. Like we're supporting SnapRoute and Junos and some others. So you know, we're building more and more of these uh, hardware platform support. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, swap in this Cisco 9332. Uh, oh, and uh, Facebook FBox, we're going to be supporting that as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in fact, we're going to do you snap route just on that. that. Yeah, yeah. OK. So the first thing I want to do is I want to decommission Spine 1. So I'm going to undeploy this node. And really, what undeploying does is it, it takes out the config that we put. So we're going to uh, undeploy it. So I'll click the undeploy button and says, OK, it's done. Now, as a result of this being undeployed, some of the other devices are like, hey, man, something's going wrong because you know, I still think this box should be there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the serial number from this uh, pod entirely. So now we're completely removing this device out of our service. Now, as a result of that, if I go back to the rack and I look at the topology, I can see that this device you know, is currently not part of my, my service definition. And what I want to do is I want to um, tell the system that it's no longer Cumulus, but it's going to be a Cisco. So we're changing part of the build of this network service. And we're going to go into a lot more detail about what, what logical device maps mean and how they're used. But this is essentially how you decide which vendor you want in this blueprint. And here you can see all of the options that you could, you could have used. And in this case, I'm going to do an override because I selected uh, 
the del cumulus as a default. So I'm going to select as an override this Cisco 9332 model. Not, not the actual device, just the model, right? And as a result of this override, I can immediately go back and see the configuration that AOS generate. So this was, just a second ago, Cumulus, and now this is Cisco, and we can see that the Cisco configuration that, you know, Appster provides you, which we believe is kind of best practice configuration for a two-stage spine leaf arrangement. Yeah. So, you and, know. And we have, we did, we work with every single vendor we support, uh, <coughs> you know, Arista, Cisco, et cetera, Cumulus, um, to, to come up with these configurations. It's not just pulled entirely, you know, out of our own butts. Right. Okay, this is really awesome. Um, I definitely like that you can just show the configuration like that, no matter what the vendor is. How do you take into consideration all of the different compatibility problems? Do you just basically eliminate those features from, from this so you don't run into that? Or are there only certain devices will flag and say, well, sorry, you can't use Cisco here for some feature? This is a, this is a really important question because it really speaks to a very important decision about how our product was architected. Um, when Derek and I did, um, you know, Puppet and some of these others, we, we started with this idea of these device level abstractions, like an interface and a VLAN and how you put these things together. And, and it leaves the composition stage to the, to the network engineer. It's like, here's a bag of Legos, do whatever you want. And uh, I can tell you that most people didn't want that. They really wanted uh, a solution that said, I know what I want. I want this service that does this thing and uh, allow me to do some kind of DevOps around the edges for it, for sure. Um, but I want something that's almost, you know, this instant gratification effect. I want to, you know, see it, do it, play with it. And, as, and if you think about what that kind of means, it means that we no longer abstract at a device level mechanism. We don't say an interface or a VLAN. What we do is we think of a network service as a composition of smaller services like a cabling validation thing or a BGP neighbor thing as, as we're kind of showing you here. So when we, when we create abstractions, it's really at that level. So as long as the device supports that kind of uh, component or part level, service part level, I, I don't know a good name to call it, then we can compose the service, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? It does make sense. So yeah, if you were to read like a Cisco uh, validated design guide, it would tell you to use a bunch of proprietary things maybe, where you don't even really need to think about that is what you're saying. Just you want to do something, but it doesn't really matter how it's done as long yeah, as you're I mean, getting to that end goal. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. That's okay. exactly right. Right. It, look, I mean, look at it from you know perspective of a network engineer, right? Like, you have you have networks that you manage, and here's some, you know, you have an L3 clause somewhere, right, in some room somewhere in some data center, and a switch is going bad. I mean, why should you waste a ton of time manually doing all this stuff and translating things? Like, it it, it kind of boggles the mind that after 20 years, 30 years, however long networking, that I can't just grab any Ethernet switch or whatever I want and just swap it out and have some tool take care of it for me. And, and that's what we're trying to build. We're trying to build that sort of augmentation so you're not wasting that time. In order to do that, right, when we say we just want a thing that does this, um, that, that's what we're enabling. Right? That's our goal is to, is to sort of, you know, avoid the complication that comes with thinking about it the wrong way, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we want. I mean, we look at what happened in the server in the server world, where they decoupled hardware and software, and it gave them so much freedom of choice and control over their infrastructure. And we are now, like in networking, just experiencing that that choice and control. And and at times we might feel overwhelmed by the the massive amount of choice that we now have, or all of the control capabilities that we're thrown at it. You know, that we say, well, we give you all these, these automation controls, have at it, good luck with that, you know, Mr. Customer. And that, to me, that's not enough. I mean, we need to create these, this technology that augments the, audit, the, the network engineer to, to do these things. So I'm going to kind of complete the, the swap here. What I'm going to do is I know that this device is going to be a Cisco uh, that represents a 32 by 40 gig spine. And we're going to go through how these these network device abstractions are, are composed. And I'm going to select from my available inventory. So AOS says, well, I know you want a Cisco, and I know the type of device needed in this design is a 32 by 40 gig. So this is the device you can use. And the moment that I apply the serial number to this device, what AOS is going to do 
is it's going to start gathering information and saying, hey, is this device, is it ready for business? Is it ready to be deployed or not? Now, we know that I haven't swapped the cables over, so clearly it's not ready. And if I looked at all of these alerts, I could see that many of these are cabling uh, related. And if I wanted to get really nice insight onto that, I would use the link validation that I showed you before. And I can see that uh, here, spine one, now these used to say swap you know, SWP, and now they're the Cisco vernacular. right? And I, I know that these leafs are connected to the wrong spine, and that's why those are green and these are red. So I'm going to now, uh, before your very eyes, <laughs> swap, these, swap this device. I'm going to go now stand next to the loud rack as I do this. So one of the things that um, I really wanted to show you, like demo, that what we can't because of the amount of time it takes, is you know, I was talking about getting the right network operating system on the device, right? Um, we really, really wanted to do this, this whole solution in a vendor agnostic way. And we also didn't want people to have to do that, right? That's a thing, again, that you don't have to do. There's no reason for you to waste time doing that. Sitting in a loud room with lots of fans, unboxing things, putting a console cable in, loading the network operating system over and over again. Why do that? So the only way to get around that and be vendor agnostic is to make a universal ZTP server. So, and that's exactly what we did. We've, we've made a universal ZTP server that supports all of the platforms, uh, network operating systems um, that we support, Cumulus, uh, Cisco, or, you know, uh, Arista, et cetera. And is it open sourced already? It's open source. Right? Yeah, it's on, it's on GitHub, it's open source. Um, the, the core of the universal ZTP server is not married to Aptra specifically. We did it as a plugin based mechanism. So it's out there for anybody to use. And we, of course, built an, an AOS Aptra add-on for it to load our agents onto devices as part of the process. But it's, if you go to our GitHub, uh, GitHub page, we've got a lot of open source projects that we're rolling out. And that's, you know, kind of, you know, we work for the community. That's part of our kind of charter is in customer enablement. We're both in customer enablement. So uh, it's awesome. I have a dream job. Uh, I have resources and awesome people to work with, and we get to build open source software that sits DevOps around the edges of our product. And uh, it's, thanks for mentioning that. It's cool. You're welcome, Jeremy. All right. So here we can see that the spine now is properly cabled, right? We, you know, we know with confidence that this, this box is ready to go. And if I were to uh, go over to spine one, I can see that it, it says, you know, it can be deployed. It, it's now at a state where it can be deployed. So I'm going to deploy it. I'm just going to click uh, the device and say, go ahead and deploy this device. And again, once we tell AOS that we're deploying this device, we now create in our system a whole new set of expectations. We now know we should start seeing LLDP with certain values coming back, and we now know that we expect to see certain BGP neighbors come back, et cetera, et cetera. And as we go through this process, we can see that uh, the, the configuration has been deployed. We know that the configuration push, if you will, was successful, right? And we can also go back and look at our dashboard to see uh, what you know, what might, be, what might be going wrong from an anomalies perspective. Again, we're looking at cabling. If I look at the nodes that's affected, I can see that leaf one and leaf two, uh, you know, they think there's something wrong with the cabling, so we can look at that. And really what this is showing us here is what the Cisco is reporting is it's not just giving me my host name, but it's also giving me the serial number as part of the LLDP, LLDP data. That's just kind of like what Cisco does for right now until it you know, goes through a, a cycle of using the configuration we push so that it doesn't do that. So, but as a, as a network engineer, you would look at this and go, okay, I know that this is right even though I've got a little bit more information here. So again, network aug augmentation technology, not automate the network engineer out of the problem kind of technology. And now once this is done, if I, uh, if I, if I uh, go back to the dashboard, this will converge in, in some amount of time, and we'll see it go green. But at this point, we have literally swapped, we've replaced, let's say, a faulty box in our network, not just with a like kind, but with a completely different vendor. So this frees you up you know, from being locked into a vendor, any yeah. vendor. You're right. You did this um, by pulling it out of you know, wherever you're keeping your extra boxes, putting it in the rack, and turning it on. 
I mean, effectively, that's all the work you did. You never touched the CLI, you didn't load the, again, you didn't load the network operating system, you pulled it out of storage, you put it in the rack, you turned it on. You just swapped it. And then a smart tool took care of all of that work for you. Cool. All right. So, you know, earlier I said, well, what happens if, like, say somebody gets on a box and makes a configuration change? You know, how is that reflected in, in uh, AOS? So uh, let's say that I'm going to do this on my, my Cisco. Let's say part of my workflow of replacing this box in my data center was, you know, checking some things out on the network. And I have to get on the box, just for whatever reason, because that happens. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to log into my, um, my spine so I can see that the management IP address, uh, I'm going to pull that from the facts here. And uh, can you guys see that OK? I'm going to uh, log in to the box. So I am on my Cisco. Now let's say that as part of what I'm doing, you know, I have to take an interface down. You know, we've all done you know, some interface work. We've got to take it down. We've got to troubleshoot something. So I'm going to go into configure, and I'm going to say internet, ethernet, 1, 1, interface, ethernet, 1, 1. And I'm going to say uh, shut down. So you know, I've shut down this interface uh, because I've got to do something, whatever that is. And uh, let's immediately see what AOS starts to report. We've got 18 alerts. Somebody shut down this port, I got 18 alerts. 18 alerts. So what's the blast radius of that shutdown command? Literally, this is one command somebody forgot to, to put back. And the blast radius is, is that, well, I've got some interfaces that are down, and any SNMP kind of tool would report that for you. That's great. I've got some cabling issues because, of course, the interface is down. But I also have BGP, and now I've got all these routing-related issues that, again, could affect the service of my network. It could make that application be slow and you get that phone call and then you're debugging it and it's literally just one command. So if I wanted to see, you know, well, what, what does that look like? How does AOS report that? Let's say that I go to spine one and I want to look at the telemetry. So we report, you know, config deviation. Again, we generated the configuration. We push the configuration. We know what it's right. You know, we can compare against it. So we can essentially give you that magical line by line diff. We can say, oh, hey, there's an error with an exclamation point because it's important. And if we look down through this, we can see exactly what shouldn't be there, right? Or this should be there. There should be a no shutdown because this is the intended running configuration. And my actual running configuration doesn't have that statement. So now. Does that mean AOS should automatically put it back for you or revert it? Well, that's not for us to decide, really. I mean, maybe this is what you really want it to be, and it be, it's going to become your new reality. But we're giving you tactical insight, like tactical pinpoint awareness to where exactly this problem is. And we can show you exactly you know, the scope and magnitude of what simply one command can do to your network. That's what we mean by situational awareness. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it back the way it was. So I'm going to say uh, no shutdown. And I'm going to get off this box. And uh, so you can immediately see I'm down to one alert. Like literally, when we talk about why is it important to have software in a, you know, a distributed systems problem that networking is, to have our software running on these devices, because they're constantly collecting information in real time, feeding that data back into our server, our servers are constantly measuring the data against the expected value and reporting anomalies or not. It, I mean, you can see like exactly with real hardware, real time, near real time responsiveness. Uh, I actually have a question from the interwebs from Chris Young, Netman Chris on Twitter. He said, <laughs> "Yeah." He says, uh, "Who defines expected software versions on replacement hardware?" Um, well, we have. You know, some number of iOS versions, some number of you know, versions of Cumulus, et cetera, that we support, and you can choose any one of those uh, to put on the box. That is the answer. So it has to be a version we, su we support, obviously, but we support multiple versions. So you can, you know, you have some choice in that. Another question we're seeing is uh, what about customizing the Blueprint config or your golden config, as you call it. Yep, so um, there's actually multiple ways to do that. Um, in 1.0, uh, 
Uh, you can uh, you can edit the Jinja templates that are uh, that that are used to generate the configs in the first place. You can put um, whatever you want in there. You can change the way the um, you know if you want to put something on the interface like you know storm control or something like that. Right? You can you can actually insert that into the Jinja template and it'll get pushed down to the uh, to the box. Are those template changes tracked in some sort of repository? So like in Git or Mm. Some kind of revisioning. That's a sure. Good yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a there's a really longer answer here, but the short answer is is that is absolutely possible because the ways that the templates are stored in our system are as textual files, just in directories. So you could use a a Git mechanism to back up and restore those, and we have our own essentially internal database mechanism. But you can also store it and save it the way you want to. Okay. So you know we, we and again, this is a 1.0 product. Yeah. So as we mature what I would call the platform extensibility thing, something I'm personally super passionate about, like how can we bring more power but make it useful in a way for non-programmers. So you, know, you don't have to be a programmer to do it, but you can get really nice you know, extensibility. We're, we're, we're actually working with some, some folks right now on that. So anybody that's very interested in SDK, platform extensibility kind of topics, um, reach out to us at community at abstra.com because you know, we're, we're in that phase of, of refining this and evolving it. And we're going to continue to do that because any technology like this, it's, it's a process. It's an evolutionary process. Um, and, but even now, like even what's happening in 1.1 stuff is, is really just leaps and bounds because uh, we have such a great team. I mean, we didn't talk about this, but the other reason why I'm super excited about what we're doing at Appster is we've got a really unique combination of engineers, uh, some of which came from your traditional networking equipment vendors that built you know, the software that runs on these types of boxes. And then we have like these distributed systems PhD types that are quickly picking up networking, it blows my mind. But putting those two types of people together in one company and focusing them on how can we build this Iron Man technology, I mean, it's amazing to see this happen. Like every day, it's incredible. Yeah, it, really it is. is cool. It yeah. is also, uh, I mean, it's humbling. It's humbling because it is humbling. I'm. Yeah. I feel like I am the dumbest person yeah. in the whole company. It's. Yeah. It's all, our engineering team is incredible. Yeah.